Well, brothers and sisters, we must confront sin when necessary in the lives of fellow believers. We must confront sin when necessary in the lives of fellow believers, fellow saints. I'd remind you that the context of this letter that we've been looking at for over maybe two and a half years now, the context is how to behave in the household of God. And that doesn't mean how to behave in a church building. It means how to behave as members of the same body of believers, as children that Christ has purchased and brought into his family. That's the broader context of this letter that we call 1 Timothy, that the Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege to train him up and to instruct him in how to shepherd the flock of God that is among him, how to behave in the household of God. And so now I want you to just briefly look at these first two verses before we seek to really separate it out and see all the individual things that we learn in this text And I want you to see why the very first thing that I said was that you and I must confront sin when necessary in the lives of fellow saints. Look at it with me. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. God says through the Apostle Paul, Do not rebuke an older man. Do not rebuke an older man. This is... The only time this this word that's translated rebuke, it is the only time it's used in the New Testament. A, A better translation of that word, not that I'm a Greek scholar by any means, but a better translation for us would be, as the New American Standard even translates that Greek word, do not sharply rebuke an older man. And the reason I think it's helpful that the New American Standard even translates it like that, and why I'm pointing it out to you, is because that word in English, rebuke, Paul uses that in 2 Timothy 4 and literally demands that Timothy rebuke when he's preaching the word specifically. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience or complete patience and teaching. That word in 2 Timothy 4.2 is not the same word that Paul uses here in writing to Timothy to say, do not do that. It is a word, it's a very sharp word and serious word, and he's saying, when you have to confront sin in the local assembly, do not rebuke sharply, or that word, literally means do not assault someone with your words. Do not chastise them with your words. Do not scold them. Do not rebuke sharply an older man. But, he says, look again, but encourage him. Parakaleo is is the Greek word. That's the only imperative in our text. That is the command. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but encourage him. The word encourage there, that literally means call someone to your side so that you can help them. It means to exhort them, to entreat, to beseech them, implore them. It means to plead with them. Or it means to admonish them. So Paul is not saying never rebuke someone. Because he commands us elsewhere to rebuke. Christ Jesus himself commands you and I to rebuke. But this word is, do not assault them, chastise them, scold them. But rather, the command is, encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters in all purity. And so the do not sharply rebuke an older man, that is attached not only to the older man in the context, it's attached to younger men. It's also attached to older women. It's also attached to younger women. 
So he's not just saying you're not allowed to sharply chastise older men, but you can do it to older women and, or you can do it to you know, whoever. That's not what he's saying. Do not sharply rebuke anyone when you have to confront them. What would you have to confront someone about? And the answer is, if your brother sins and someone does need to be confronted in some way, do not sharply rebuke them, but encourage them, implore them, admonish them, exhort them. And that exhort or encourage, as it's translated in the English Standard Version, that is also attached to older men, younger men, older women, younger women. So all of those are attached to all four of the categories. And the context of what Paul is writing to Timothy about is what to do when you have to confront, when you have to confront a fellow saint in their sin. What to do. So that's the context. But now let me just pull in some other passages of Scripture to make sure that you understand what the Lord tells us concerning our duty to confront our fellow believers when necessary if they're in sin. It's for the glory of God and the good of our neighbor that we must do it. Consider Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you or consider him as a Gentile and a tax collector which is you have to consider that brother that by how he is living and what he's doing, he is an, he's acting like an unbeliever. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Luke 17, 3 through 4. Christ says, pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins... Not if your brother sins against you. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. You see why it's important sometimes to understand what the word is that Paul or any of the apostles or any of the biblical writers are using. And sometimes it's good to look at the original languages. Because if you didn't, you would say, Paul says we can't do that. Christ says we have to do that. Paul tells Timothy you can't do this. And then in his next letter, he says that you have to do this when you preach. So Christ says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Proverbs 27.5 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. That means it's better to have someone confront you if you're in sin than to just say, I don't know, I'm just going to try to love them. Or act like they love you when they really have something against you and they need to call you out on it. Proverbs 27, 6, the very next verse. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. In Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Paul writes to the churches in Galatia and says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So part of bearing one another's burdens is being willing to help a brother repent. And being willing to even confront them if they have sinned. In Ephesians 4, 25-27, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and says, Having put away all falsehood, 
Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. If you are not willing to confront your fellow saints when necessary, when they sin, you're not speaking the truth with your neighbor. Put away falsehood. Put away any kind of deceit and falsehood and speak the truth with your neighbor. For we are members of one another, Paul says. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And then in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, to help us understand the seriousness of if someone has sinned or even sinned against us, or maybe we have sinned against them and we don't want to deal with it. Christ says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. This is just a few verses in God's word that help us understand the seriousness of especially a body of believers, a local assembly, that at times we're going to have to confront one another. If we love them, we will confront them. And if we love the glory of God we will confront them when we have to. And this is what Paul's talking about at the beginning of 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. This is how not to do it, and this is how you should do it. Now, the church of Christ is likened to many different things in the Scriptures. Many metaphors are used in the Bible to communicate this this is what the church is like. So one of them is a, a body Paul's going to use that metaphor in 1 Corinthians later and say the church is like a body with many members. The church is also called a kingdom where Christ is the king and we are the subjects. The church is also likened to a priesthood by which all of us being cleansed by the blood of Jesus and filled by God the Holy Spirit offer spiritual sacrifices in worship to God. A priesthood. The church is also likened to the temple, that we are now the temple of the living God. His spirit dwells in us, and we are even like living stones stacked together, which are being built up to be a holy temple for the Lord. The scripture also speaks of the church as a vine. We are connected to the vine, which is Christ, and we derive all of our spiritual nourishment from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're the branches. Christ is the vine. And then the church is called a flock, like a flock of sheep. And so we have shepherds and sheep. And we have the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's used, there's many different metaphors used in the New Testament for what the local church is like and what we, how we should think about one another. And Maybe I've not mentioned all of them, but the last one I want to point your attention to is the one that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. And that is that the local church is a family. The local church is a family. And that is probably the most frequently used metaphor for the church in the entire New Testament. How many times can you remember reading through any New Testament letters, or even in the Gospel accounts, to where brothers, dot, 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 brothers, dot, dot, dot. It's all the time. That's probably one of the most common, that's probably Paul's most common way to talk to Christians, to say, brothers, you are brothers, you're brothers and sisters, you're children of God. You're in, even in this, in this letter, he says, this is how you ought to behave in the household of God as family members that Christ, your big brother, has brought you in through his death and resurrection. The father has adopted you and the spirit has put a seal of adoption on you. You are a family. And that's the metaphor Paul uses here to say, when you have to confront sin in a believer, you must do so as a member of the same family. That's why he says, do not sharply rebuke, don't chastise, 
but admonish them and exhort them. Or as the ESV says, encourage them just like you would do a dad. Encourage them just like you would do your mom. Just like you would do a brother or just like you would do a sister. That's the metaphor he uses and he's saying when you have to confront someone, you have to do it thinking, and I think primarily we should be thinking family, not, well, I have to confront my brother or sister in Christ in sin because we are a kingdom of priests. But Paul's saying think family when you have to do that, Timothy. Think family. And so now look at these four things, and I hope you understand the context of what he's doing and why he is saying this is how you don't do it, this is how you do it. But just rather quickly, I point you to these four things that he says. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. What are you going to do when a brother in Christ who's much older than you sins and you know about it? Or they sin against you. How do you do that? I think there are many who won't approach or confront an older man because it's like, well, who am I? I'm just a young man. Who is he to listen to me? And so if you've ever thought that, that's got to be out of your mind right now because Paul says, well, you need to take care that you're not sharply rebuking him, but you must come alongside him and admonish him, exhort him, and encourage him the way that you would do a father. So older men, you are to treat them like fathers, especially when it comes to confronting them in sin. Secondly, look, the next group that he mentions is older women, or rather, younger younger men. So when you confront sin in a younger man, you must not rebuke him sharply, but you must encourage him as you would a brother. This is a brother that you're dealing with. Encourage him. Encourage him as you would a brother. That's what he means when he says younger men as brothers at the end of verse 1. And so you need to look at those who are around your same age. Younger men doesn't always, it doesn't mean he's younger than you. It just means a younger man. But you need to talk to him as you would a brother. How would you love your brother or your sister in your own family if they were caught in any transgression or if they sinned against you. You go and talk to them. This is family, and I remember that they're family, and I have to do it and encourage him, exhort him, appeal to him, admonish him, remembering that is my brother. And then the third group that he uses is an older woman. What do you do if an older woman sins against you? Can you even go talk to them? How awkward may that be? If an older woman, who might, might could be your mother, sins or sins against you, not only sins against you, but as Christ says in Luke 17, if any of your fellow believers sin, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. If they sin, you have to confront them. But how do you do it? Well, you do it just like you would do to your mom. And the way that you're going to talk to your mom should be differently than you're going to talk to a man it should be differently than you're going to talk to even a younger woman. But he's saying, just think about family. That's your mom. Talk to her like that. Love her enough to talk to her, but make sure that you are encouraging her, exhorting her as you would a mother. And then the fourth group that he mentions is younger women. And this, especially for Timothy, could be the most difficult too. It's like, what do I do with younger women? who've sinned, and Timothy as a pastor is, is going to have to confront that. What do I do? Do I just leave it to somebody else? Or do I say, well, they're just learning or growing? No, Paul is saying, you must do it. But you have to do it as if she is your sister. That is a sister in Christ. That's a sister in your family. So you have to love her enough to come alongside her Appeal to her, admonish, exhort her, but do not rebuke her sharply. This is family. And then he adds at the very end, and the jury's out on does in all purity apply to all four? Or does in all purity only apply to younger? 
It, it could apply to all four if we take that word in the Greek to mean what it, what it basically means is with sinlessness. Make sure that you are sinless in how you do it. But often that word is even used to talk of sexual purity. And so it could be that Paul is saying in all of this, not rebuking sharply, admonishing or encouraging all four of these groups. And then he finishes that with, and all of this with all four groups must be done sinlessly. Take care that you in confronting sin and a fellow believer are not sinning against them by the way that you're even doing it. He could mean that. Or he could mean, you better take special care to be pure in all of your conduct to any younger woman, especially. Whatever he means, whether he means that or in sinlessness with it all, both of those things are true things that you and I must do. And I don't know what Paul means here. Does he only mean younger? Does he mean all? Either way, both of those things are true. You must make sure not to sin against your brother, or sister, when you have to confront them, as Paul directs Timothy to do. Brothers and sisters, look at this. Look at these four groups. This covers everyone. Everyone in the local church. Well, they're older than me. He said older men. Well, it's a woman. He said older women. He said younger men. He said younger women. Everyone is covered, and we must love one another enough And we must love God enough that if our brother sins against us, we'll go and talk to him. As Christ says, one-on-one, go and tell them. If you love your brother and sister enough, you're going to confront them. And confront doesn't mean, hey, I got a bone to pick with you. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It could mean that. If someone wrongs you seriously, you need to say, hey, we need to get together and we're getting together today. I need you to make it happen. Because they may have seriously wronged you. But that's not necessarily what I mean by confront. It just means you need to deal with it. For the glory of Christ, for the good of that person, and thirdly, so that bitterness does not take root in your heart. If you are not, re- if you are not willing to confront your brothers and sisters, no matter what their age, no matter who they are, when they sin or when they sin against you, If you're not willing to do that, you better watch out. Because bitterness will take root in your heart if you do not deal with sin. Christ will not be glorified because that person needs to be made aware if they've sinned against you. Christ needs to be glorified. They need to be loved. And you need to be careful not to get bitter by just burying and burying and burying and not dealing with sin. This is the uncomfortable part of being a body of believers together. We have to love one another enough to do these hard things, and we have to make sure that when we do them, we do them in the way that the Lord God commands us to do it, especially here through Paul. Take care. You who don't have a problem with confronting your brother or sister in Christ, take care that you are not chiding them, chastising them, You're not rebuking them sharply. Take care that you are encouraging them. And you, you who don't want to deal with sin, you don't want to have to deal with that in your brothers and sisters, take care that you obey the commands of the Lord. Now I want you all, if you would, grab your Bible and go to the right. It's that way for you, this way for me. And go to 1 John 1, 5-9. And let's finish with this hope. This hope. And as you're turning there, hear me. All of us stumble in many ways. All of us stumble in many ways. And if you're going to be faithful to your brothers and sisters, you are going to have to do what Paul tells Timothy to do in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. You're going to have to do it at some point. You will. If you're going to be faithful. We all are still battling our indwelling sin, and everyone stumbles into it. And we have to love one another enough to confront, not rebuke sharply, encourage, and remember that we're always pointing each other to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 John 
chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. 1 John 1, 5 through 9. This is the message we have heard from him, from Christ, and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is good news. That is good news for weary travelers like you and like me who still sin in many ways, though we hate it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when you go to confront a brother and a sister, go armed with passages like that. Not just, Christ says, rebuke you. Go armed with, so let's confess our sins. And the promises through the blood of Jesus Christ will be cleansed of our sins. But if we want to act like we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Beloved, there is no sin that can be confronted that cannot also be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no sin you can ever confront in a believer that cannot also be covered by Christ's blood. Christ's blood will wash away the darkest stain. So go to your brothers and sisters when you have to, armed with that good news. Love God enough to do it. Love your neighbor enough to do it. And take care that you don't let bitterness rise up in yourself. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word here in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. We thank you that in your providence, this is exactly where we were at as, moving, as we move through 1 Timothy. Apply this to our hearts. Change our minds. Help us to love you enough to be willing to confront sin in our fellow saints. Help us to do it with gentleness. Help us to not rebuke sharply, but to come alongside and exhort, encourage, admonish, as we would a father or a mother or a brother or a sister. Thank you for making us family in Christ Jesus. We ask you to help us to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We ask you to purify your bride. Save those who are not yet in Christ. We ask you to save all of our children. Save anyone who's Not in Christ, even though they may say they are. Cause regeneration to happen in false professors. We ask you to sanctify your people. Make us more like Jesus, more dependent on Jesus. Help us to trust ourselves less and trust you more. And may you be glorified as we press on as this body of believers. For your glory, for our good, we ask all this in Christ's name.